afternoon. I am Karen Tracy, and I'm speaking with Colin Copeland today. Uh, we're working on a project that uses OpenBlock, and we're going to give a talk describing OpenBlock and some of our experiences with it. We think it's a cool project. It doesn't doesn't have a lot of uh, activity or community around it, and we'd like to sort of raise awareness of it and tell you about it. Uh, Brief outline of what we're going to talk about. We're going to start with um, describing what OpenBlock is and uh, some of its history and get into some of our experiences using it in the project we're working on. And then some, we'll talk about some extensions we've made to it to help out what, in ways that we think uh, it was lacking a little bit. And finally, talk a little bit about the future. Um, to start with an introduction, what is OpenBlock? It is a hyper-local news application framework. I think that those words came straight off of the website for it. it um, it's a framework that's designed to let you write, easily bring local news items into, onto your website. So if you have a site with local focus, um, you can might start adding things to it like um, police incidents reports, you know, down the block, Johnny got arrested for disturbing the peace, or Mary over there a couple blocks away sold her house for such and such amount of money, that kind of stuff. Um, it allows you to bring that local, not, not global news breaking news kind of things, but local flavored news into your site and put it on a map and allow people to browse by their location and see what's happening in their, in their town, that kind of thing. Um, kinds of rest, kind of uh, news items that we have dealt with include things like police reports and property transactions, restaurant inspections, and corporation filings. OpenBlock is an open source project. Uh, the code is out available on GitHub, on GitHub, GitHub Open Plans OpenBlock. They do have a website with pointers to documentation. That's at openblockproject.org. And there is a mailing list, which is a Google group, um, and that is named EB Code. And that goes back to where OpenBlock came from, which I'll get to in a little bit. Uh, before I get there, though, what kind of sites might use OpenBlock? If you have a site that has a local focus, you're not setting out to build the next global phenomenon of a site. If you've got a local flavored focus and you've got some uh, local community interest that you might, um, you might want to pull in news items and make them available to people, um, it really helps if you have those, the, the raw data for those new items already available somewhere so that you can write code that just pulls those in, scrapes them off of other new sites, and pulls them into your site in a nicely presented way. So um, it's not necessary that the other sites already have them pre prettily formatted. It's actually kind of good if you're able to take some raw data from another site bring it into your site and present it in a way that's digestible to people um, and pretty. OpenBlock came from a project called EveryBlock, which you may have heard from, that was heard of, that was founded, a uh, web startup founded by Adrian Halavati back in 2007. Uh, it was funded by a Night News Challenge grant and it was started by, they at least started with a team of six to build this hyper-local news application framework type site. They launched in 2008, early 2008, with covering Chicago, New York, and San Francisco. A few months later, they added Charlotte and Philadelphia. Um, a year or so later, they were acquired by MSNBC. And nowadays, if you go out to that site, you see they cover 16 cities with three more coming soon. And if you do go out there, this is an example of what every block in Chicago looks like. You can um, browse around by neighborhoods. Um, you can uh, also draw like an area that you're interested in and see what's happening in that area. Um, there's plenty of public record information available on the site. There's also a community interaction focus that I see on every block that doesn't necessarily uh, exist yet, at least in open block. Um, and there's a lot of community activity depending on which which site you're on. So every block, the source code for every block was made available in July of 2009. Um, it was a stipulation, I think, of the Night News funding grant that the code be open source. So two years after it was started, it was made available. Um, it was put out there as seven tarballs on Google code. And um, 
After that, every block continued to get developed on its own with its own copy of the code, and open block code was just put out there. Um, the o every block developers didn't, didn't continue to develop that code that they had made available, which may seem a little bit odd, but I think it was also a stipulation of the grant that they have a um, business plan and a plan for making money uh, with their project, and that I can see how that didn't necessarily encompass creating an open source community and building an open source project um, and taking contributions and managing how things are going to go forward. Um, so the code was made available, but the people who worked on it didn't continue to, to focus on that code. So there was a little bit of a pause there while we waited for the next thing to happen, which Colin will start to talk about. Great, thanks. So yeah, the, the every block code was open sourced and it had fairly limited adoption for about a, a year from what I could tell, um, doing some research. And there was a little bit of traffic on the EB code mailing list. Um, but then a, a year later in June of 2010, the Knight Foundation launched an open block initiative grant, um, which had a, a goal to sort of simplify and accelerate the adoption of this code that was open sourced by every block. And they were going to call it open block. Um, and the, the grant was divided three ways. A portion of it went to open plans to streamline and extend open block over two years. A portion went to the Columbia Daily Tribune to install and test it in the context of a smaller newspaper. And, it also, and a portion also went to the Boston Globe to install and test it in the context of a, a larger newspaper. And so two years la later, this is sort of what open block looks like today. Uh, it's easier to install and set up. Code base has been consolidated into four core modules. The most important are the EB code and um, EB pub modules as they contain the geocoding, scraping, and display logic. Um, the current and previous versions are available to install on PyPy. And the code's online. There's a demo site that you can sort of click around on and see how it works. And there's also really good documentation available. And I'd like to take a moment to talk briefly about the OpenBlock architecture. It's divided into four main components. There's the web UI, which is what you see when you go to an OpenBlock site to sort of browse around and browse by blocks and, and see the maps and the points on the maps. There are scrapers, which are scripts that you write to um, extract data from external sites and import them into the open block data models. There's the geocoder, which analyzes location names and addresses to associate them with a point. And then there's the data model, which sort of encompasses all this at the, the lower end. And so I've highlighted a couple of the important open block data models here, divided into two categories. There are the news models of which there's a schema and a news item. And the schema describes a particular data set like a restaurant inspection. And then there's a news item, which is an in individual piece of news associated with that schema, like a restaurant inspection at this particular location. And then there are the, the geocoder models. So there's a street, which is just a street with a unique name, an intersection with a point representing the meeting of two streets, and a block, which is a segment of a street between two intersecting streets. So I've created a few diagrams here to help um, visualize what, what these data models represent. So here's an example city that has Main Street divided by First and Second Street. And the street model represents an entire street. So you can see the entire length of Main Street highlighted here. And the block model is just one segment of a street including the left and right address ranges for that segment. So in this case, this is Main Street, or the segment of Main Street that has the address range from 100 to 349. It includes the left and right side of the street, so the odd and even addresses on that street. And blocks are really fundamental to the open block system. They're used both in geocoding, but are also used on the front end to, to browse the site. We'll talk a little bit more about blocks later, but I wanted to bring them up here just to familiarize them with you. 
And so we'll talk a little bit about some open block sites that are out there right now. There's the open block demo site. It's the flagship demo for open block in Boston, Massachusetts. It's an ideal example for open block since it's set up in a large city similar to the ones in every block. And it has very recent data, including restaurant inspections and police reports. Um, that's a demo. There are also other sites that are um, created independently of it. There's Open Campus Kent, which was created by the Kent State University in Ohio. It's a simple site using only a few open block views, but it does have crime reports and reviews from Yelp and a news feed from the local campus newspaper. There's also Larryville KU, which was created by the University of Kansas. Uh, in addition to the other features, it has some Twitter integration and accident reports. And this was done as a joint venture between the School of Journalism and a student newspaper. And, and so this newspaper partnership is related to what we've been working on with Open Rural. And so what Open Rural is, is we're taking Open Block and using it in rural North Carolina communities. And so these are small towns with small news organizations and newspapers that don't have a lot of digital resources and they lack the resources to make the public data <coughs> digestible on the web. And so this is quite different than a typical open block setup in a bigger city with a lot more infrastructure. And so Open Rural was funded by a three-year Night News Challenge grant in June of 2011. Uh, it's led by Ryan Thornburg, who's a professor at the School of Journalism and Mass Communication at University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. And Cactus is working with him to help develop and deploy open rural to these communities in North Carolina. Um, so the goals are to apply the same open block tools to rural North Carolina communities, to increase access to local public records, and to do this by helping local newspapers leverage open block. So our initial focus is in Columbus County, North Carolina. It's a small county in the southeastern part of the state with about 50,000 residents. And we're working with a local newspaper to incorporate public records onto their site. The newspaper is called The News Reporter. This is an online version of the, of the site that um, serves both Whiteville and the greater Columbus County area. And I'll pass it to Karen to talk about our experiences. OK. Um, if you look, if you bring up search on Columbus County, North Carolina on Google Maps, you get a picture that looks something like this. Um, you can see there's a fair number of roads in there. Um, there's no big, huge center of population. There's a couple smaller ones that we'll look at a little more detail in a bit. Um, there's no interstates that go through Columbus County, so it is pretty rural. Um, and the first thing you might wonder sitting out there is if you were going to build this kind of site, how would you get the street and block data that Colin was talking about in terms of geocoding models for an area like this? Um, and it turns out there's, at least for the United States, I apologize for anyone in other countries who might be interested in this. I don't know what sources of data there is for the, outside the United States for this kind of stuff. But for the United States, if you're um, looking at building an open block site, there's probably a few different sources of data you could consider. One would be census files. The census, US Census provides a bunch of different kinds of files, um, and OpenBlock has utilities to help import this data into the, into the system so that you could use the census data for streets and blocks uh, as your OpenBlock data. Alternatively, counties individually may provide files describing the road center lines in their counties um, and the towns in their counties. And um, State Department of Transportation sites may also use provide, use these kinds of files and make them available. So that's another alternative. Um, in choosing between what kind of data you want to use, probably the biggest thing you're going to look at is how accurate and complete is the data. Uh, we started with the census data, and we were a little bit disappointed to find out that it was not as good as we would have hoped it would be. And we found that out because the Columbus County GIS department that we're working with um, 
does provide a file of addresses for all of Columbus County. So we had a big, huge data set of valid addresses in the county that we could run through our geocoder after loading the database and find out how it did. Um, so we've evaluated a couple of these different sources of data with that addresses file um, and found out that the census data was not as good as we wanted it to be. But before I get to that, I wanted to talk a little bit about a couple of challenges that Columbus County presents as compared to other open block um, installations. This picture just shows Columbus County and the town, the incorporated towns and cities in Columbus County. Those are in the blue. And the green area is unincorporated. So that's people who just live out in the county. Um, and this is different from a typical open block or every block installation, which is focused on a, a city and where everyone's in the same city. Um, and that presented a couple of challenges. Um, first of all, because we have this multi-city case, uh, open block does support a multi-city installation. There's a switch you can flip and say, I'm multi-city. And when you flip that switch, a lot of your URL patterns change to include a city slug so that when you're browsing by streets and blocks and stuff, there's a city indicator in the slug in your URL to indicate what city this particular main street you're looking at is part of. Um, so that is supported by OpenBlock. It isn't the default. We did run across a couple bugs where that wasn't as fully tested as the other default installation, but those were easy enough to fix. Um, but the other sort of problem you have there is you have this notion that you have to name a city slug for any location you want to browse to, but what do you call all those unincorporated areas? They don't really have a good name to, to give to them. Um, so we threw around a whole lot of different ideas, like having one big unincorporated area, um, possibly subdividing everything by zip codes, but people don't really identify with their zip codes. Um, in the end, what we're going with right now turns the census data and the county data itself all both have files that subdivide the county into sections and they give names to those sections. Some of them are meaningful, like the Whiteville area has Whiteville's section around it. Um, some of them are maybe not so meaningful to residents in the area, but at this point it seems better than nothing. So we've gone with these county subdivisions. So even if you're in an unincorporated area, you get some name that your area is covered by. Um, Let's go back to the census data and uh, what we saw when we used the census data for populating our blocks and streets. Uh, we only got a 70% success rate on that 38,000 addresses from Columbus County, which we thought was kind of low. Now, we know it's probably never going to be 100% because there's always going to be little errors and things that can't get handled properly, but 70% was a lot lower than we were expecting. Um, so. This, using the census data was really easy because, as I said, OpenBlock supports importing this data directly. It's very easy to write a couple commands to say, fetch these files from the census, load them into OpenBlock, and just get going. But this rather low success rate on geocoding was a little bit concerning. And when we dug into why we were having these kinds of failures of an inability to geocode to place on the map a valid address, we found that the census data was just missing some things. Um, and an example here is where you might have three segments of Main Street um, running through a city, and one of them, say we're trying to geocode 120 Main Street. Um, if you look at what we have for data here, we've got a block of Main Street that has 101 to, one, to 349 on one side, and for some reason, there's no information about the numbers on the other side of the street. So OpenBlock currently will not be able to geocode 120 Main Street to this block because this block doesn't say that it covers that side of the street, um, that number on the, either side of the street. Um, possibly we could try and make OpenBlock a little more forgiving there to say, well, you know, this other side of the street has these numbers, probably this side has similar numbers. Um, but for right now, it doesn't do that. And when we dug into why OpenBlock didn't have the numbers, it turned out that the underlying census file was missing the numbers. Sometimes the underlying census file was missing the names of the street, in which case, I mean, you could see that the segment existed in the underlying census file, but it didn't have a name, it didn't have numbers. There wasn't a whole lot OpenBlock could do with it. Um, Another class of problem we ran into, which 
Whoops. What did I hit? You hit just open. Um, another class of problem we hit into was um, streets with multiple names. A lot of streets that run through the state have state route numbers, and they run through multiple cities, and they have different names as they run through different cities. So what is State Route 20 in one city, it, in, you know, as it comes into the city, turns into Main Street, and then as it goes out of the city, it goes into another city, and it turns into North Salem Street or something. Um, so there's this notion that the road has multiple names. The underlying census data also supports the fact the road has multiple names, and it identifies one of them as primary. But OpenBlock, when we first started using it, sort of picked at random one of those names. So um, in this case, it may have um, picked State Route 20 in a case where really the primary should have been Main Street. So people would write an address of maybe 50 Main Street, and that should geocode to the first block up there. But it's unable to do it because the name imported was um, State Route 20 for that. So that was. That was something that we could fix, although we could fix it to use the primary properly. We did not come up with a good solution yet to use the primary. And by the way, remember all the alternates so that if someone uses that in an address that we know it. So that's still a somewhat out, outstanding problem. Um, but that was helpful. Um, and we actually, that was a problem that we fixed before we got to the 70% success rate. Um, prior to that, I think we had probably closer to 56% success on geocoding all those addresses. Um, so our second approach was to try and use county data, because the county provides, the county that we're working with provides a road center lines file that provides all the same data as um, the census, and we were hoping would be more complete and accurate. And in fact, it was, we got, just by switching the data source from 70% to 93% success rate on geocoding. Um, we have gotten that closer to 99% by fixing a couple other bugs and setting up some misspellings for um, street names. So that's, that's pretty good at indication that this data source is um, pretty reasonable to work with. But it is specific to Columbus County. And we had to write a little bit of code to process this file instead of the census file and bring that into open block. So it's not entirely generalizable to other counties, although it's taught us that it's not that hard to do. Um, but another problem with this approach is that not all counties will have this data available. Ryan Thornburg went out to um, do some research and figure out, well, since we are looking at putting open block, open rural in other counties, you know, will this data universally be available? And it turns out maybe half the state, half the counties in the state have this kind of data available. So the net of this all is, um, we're finding that geocoding, even though OpenBlock has a huge amount of code involved in geocoding, it does a good job of cleaning up addresses that are not very well formed and finding where they may be on the map. It's still a hard problem. And even um, there are still addresses that it's just not going to be able to find, even with a good data set. Um, even when you're just breaking down the address part, throw away the city state zip, the address part of a an address may contain a number, it may contain a pre-directional like North Salem Street. Uh, the street name itself may contain several words. Um, the street type may be road, maybe avenue, maybe court. When people are writing the address, they may not include that, so you kind of have to take that part of the name advisedly. Um, there may also be a post-directional component to an address. Um, so there's a whole lot of string parsing and trying to guess what these little things are that um, goes into geocoding. And it's, not easy to fix when we hit problems where the parser can't figure out what's what. Um, as I mentioned, streets, we, there is a capability to set up misspellings for street names, and that did help us get past some of our problems. Like there's a Green Swamp Road. One of the files has it as Green Swamp without any space, and one of the other files has it with a space in it. So it's easy enough to set up a misspelling to say Green Swamp with the space is equivalent to Green Swamp without a space. Um, that got us like 3%, I think, on our uh, 38,000 addresses. But it is still not 100%, and um, one of the things Colin will mention later is we're wondering if we should look at falling back to a third-party geocoding service if our open block install can't, can't manage to geocode an address. Um, 
I want to talk briefly about scrapers. Scrapers are what's using this geocoding ability. They're pulling, um, they're pulling data off of other websites, and that data usually includes an address, and the address needs to be geocoded in order to be placed on a map. Um, they can scrape various different kinds of data sources. They can scrape web pages. Sometimes, um, like the Department of Health and Human Services has report files out for re restaurant inspections. So those are not things people would ordinarily browse, but it gives you the raw data you need if you wanted to make restaurant inspections available online. Um, so you might scrape CSV files or XLS files or Navy DIFF files. Um, in one of our cases, we're combining one of those kinds of files with shape files from the, the county GIS office and combining them all together uh, to put the property transactions online in a way that's kind of pretty. Um, so that's the job of scrapers. The scrapers we've worked with for the news reporter include a couple I've mentioned, um, restaurant inspections, property transactions. We also have um, corporation filings and North Carolina Secretary of State has a website that records corporation filings and we pull those in as news items. Um, something notable about the first two of those, the corporations and the restaurant inspections are working off of statewide data. And we've done them in a sort of a two level section where there's a piece on a site called Scraper Wiki that takes all of the statewide data and pulls it off of the source and keeps it in a database on Scraper Wiki. And then it's very easy to pull a, a subset of that data for the county you're interested in onto your open block site. Um, so that's a technique we've used. Unfortunately, we don't really have enough time to go into Scraper Wiki. Um, property transactions are very local um, to Columbus County. As I said, we're pulling um, some shape files from the county GIS office to get URLs and property locations. Um, and we're getting the property transaction data also off of the Columbus County tax site. Um, Notably missing from what we have here is um, one that I think would be interesting was police incident reports, and that is missing because there is no online data source for those. Not only is there no online data source, but there's some question as to whether the people who have that data want to make it available for online consumption without some curating of it. Um, so the police department itself is worried about privacy concerns and um, certain types of incidents, not, not wanting to have wide of it, wide you know, distribution without, without more care being taken. So um, in doing this kind of thing, you do have to wonder, you do have to worry about where you're gonna get your data from. Um, and in some cases, it may be kind of hard to get. Uh, this is what this, our open rural install for Columbus County looks like. It skinned with the news reporter, newspaper outline, um, and within that we have our open block um, little map with the different communities and areas you can browse by and the different kinds of news items we have. And the property transaction scraper, um, this is a detailed page for a particular property transaction. One of the things we can pull from one of the GIS files is a URL for an image for the property, so we can pull that in um, if that's available and show you actually a picture of it, um, who bought it, who sold it, when it was bought and sold, and the prices and the tax value, so it's kind of cool. Um, all of this is running somewhat atypical, open rural, open block setup. Um, we use Fabric to automate our provisioning and deployment. Um, We've also, OpenBlock has its own in custom scheduler for some auto, automating tasks. Instead, we're using Celery and RabbitMQ because we use Celery generally for our projects. Um, and it just seemed better to go with, to be consistent. Um, we've also pulled, there's a, OpenBlock was written before static files was in Django. There is a branch of OpenBlock that has static, uses static files in Django. Um, the master, the main trunk master uses its own custom thing. So we've used, we've pulled for what we're using that fork that uses Django static files in, um, and that works well. On production, we run Nginx and GUnicorn on a small Amazon EC2 instance. Um, most of the issues that we found in OpenBlock, we have pushed back and fixed in the base OpenBlock. Uh, we have some that are still pending, evaluating whether what we're hitting is really applicable um, broadly or if it's something local to us. Um, everything is open source, and our project 
is on GitHub at Open Rural. And Colin is going to talk about some extensions we've made. Okay. So we've highlighted our experience with Open Block and how we've used it in the context of Open Rural. And we wanted to cover a little bit of what we've done to extend it and add features to it that we thought were needed. And in one case, Open Rural handles the scraping and public viewing really well, but it, it doesn't really provide the review and analysis, so like what happens after a scraper runs. So we found ourselves asking questions like, how successful was the geocoder, and how many news, news items were added, or why did this address fail to geocode, and how could I possibly correct it? And so we created what we call the data dashboard, and it's a simple extension to the open block scraper architecture that provides st statistics related to each run. So you can see here we have five scrapers for restaurants, properties, addresses, news reporter, and corporations. Their associated schemas, and the last time that the scraper happened to run for each of those um, schemas. The data dashboard keeps track of each run for every scraper, including the execution time and status. Um, in this case, so here's the corporations. You can see that there are 96 news items and a list of all of the runs. And since this scraper runs multiple times a day, I think it's every six hours, it doesn't always ingest new data when it runs. And so we have it filtered here to only show the runs that updated data. So you can see the third row there that took two minutes to import, and that's because we had removed all the news items from the database, and it went back in and scraped and re-imported them all. And then it ran consecutively, not finding any news items until the 26th, where it found one, and it took five seconds to import. The data dashboard also includes high-level statistics for each run. So you can see here that the we downloaded 94 corporations. We attempted to geocode 94 of them, and we only successfully geocoded 80, which gave us about an 85% success rate. We captured the various geocoding exceptions that occurred during this run, and we also included a, a link to the failures there at the bottom. And if you were to click on that link, you get a detailed list of all the failures that are associated with this scraper. And this includes the, the date of the failure, the location or string that failed to geocode, just like the address, um, the geocoding exception name, and a link to, to go and fix it in the admin. And so the, the first one here is a does not exist exception. And after some digging around, we found out that 871 Murray Haywood Road isn't actually in Columbus County, even though we were scraping it off the Columbus County portion of the Secretary of State website. And so we had only imported the uh, center lines for within Columbus County, and so obviously it's not going to exist when we try to geocode it. The, the second one there uh, failed as a parsing error because there's Open Block has some issues with dashes in the name, so if we were to remove the dash B and just try to geocode 107 Live Oak Street, it would work. And we could do that if we click the fix link and it would take you to the admin and let you modify the form and save it and it would re-geocode it. And so you can use the data dashboard by simply using a data or a dashboard mixing class that we have. And so here you can see the corporation scraper uses a scraper wiki base class that we wrote to pull things off scraper wiki, like Karen mentioned. And we've just added a dashboard mix in that'll give us all the statistics and stuff that we saw on the previous screens. So we sort of think this is a nice addition to the, a nice piece to add into the overall open block architecture. And so in closing, we want to talk a little, about, a little bit about what's next. So we're currently in Columbus County, um, but the grant that is funding it stipulates that we scale up to multiple counties. So we're hoping to expand into a dozen or more counties in North Carolina. Um, the grant also stipulates that, like the other grants, that it's looking for a, a profitable solution. So we're trying to weigh our options now moving forward on what, what we should focus on, like what's the best, where we should spend our time moving forward. 
So some of the options that we're considering, like Karen had mentioned, improving the geocoder is pretty tough and therefore expensive. So we're considering possibly falling back to a third-party geocoder like Google or some of the other third-party geocoders out there. Um, the, the web UI code is hard to use and extend. We um, had to skin the open block site with uh, the, the news reporter styles, which was pretty hard to do. And then if we wanted to go further and actually change some of the, the code on how open block uses the maps, it has some, it's an interesting setup. And I think with the JavaScript libraries that sort of interact with these slippy maps nowadays would make it a lot easier to, to do this. So I think rewriting it would make our lives easier in the future. So that's one option we're considering. We're also thinking about sustainability as we scale. Like, would it be more efficient to build a single system to po power all counties? Since in our case, most of the counties would, we just have like a, some uh, data feeds that would be similar on all the sites and we wouldn't really, ha they wouldn't be that different other than the skins. Um, and so that's sort of like what, what we're considering moving forward. We also want to talk a little bit about the open block community as a whole. Um, it's largely been developed through grant funding. And I wanted to mention here that Paul Winkler of Open Plans has been really helpful to us and he's very active on, in the community and on the, the mailing list. However, the, the night funding for his involvement has ended and Open Plans is no longer actively working on or open block anymore. So at this point, the future of the community is a little bit unknown. And we, we kind of think that open block needs an organic online community to, to survive. So if you guys, if anyone's interested in working on open block, you should get in touch with us while we're here at DjangoCon. And that's the end of our talk. We have slides up on, on GitHub, and we can open it up for questions. Question about how well OpenBlock can handle uh, the annexations and changes of specific addresses in different counties, or uh, do you understand what I'm saying about how, I mean, especially in Wake County, they're very big on, they have the county, the town's limits, and then they have where they can actually extend to, and they progressively just add more and more addresses into their official town. Mm -hmm. So can OpenBlock handle that sort of change? of an address? Have you encountered that at all? If we can, we could import a new, in that case, the extent of a city is changing, essentially. So yeah. what's covered by the city is changing. I think it's fairly straightforward to just import a new version of the, the file that holds that information without breaking anything. Um, if, you, if you actually want to go and start changing the block data, I think it runs into a little bit of problems with possibly having news items attached to the blocks and possibly impacting news items you've, uh, you've already imported. But I think for just changing city extents, it's not a big deal to just import a new city file and change what the extent of all your cities are. OK. Cool. Um, I've had some experience um, with the New York State Liquor Authority and how they track liquor licenses uh, to who they distribute in their locations. And it was like a list about 40,000 addresses. Um, the problem was they gave it to me as a CSV file, and they didn't have a database for it. And apparently, this is common with actual uh, state departments or like government offices. Um, in, in your experience, what's the uh, most difficult data sets you'd have to work with? And was there also any data sets that you would have loved to get access to, but for some bureaucratic reason, they would not permit you to have it, whether it's the incident reports um, from police, although I don't think those are really ever have any useful information in them. Um, the most difficult data source we've come across? Yeah, like the most, like, was there one data source that everyone used, but for some arcane reason, it was never replaced because, like, no one uh, said. CSV would have been lovely <laughs> for both of what we've used. Um, wow. the, 
The restaurant data is in Crystal Report export files, which has no actual, I don't know if it has a format, but it's kind of text, so you can look at it and see, hmm, that looks like this, that looks like this, and it's two different files, and you can kind of, well, this number probably matches with this number. So you kind of reverse engineer what you're looking at. Um, the biggest problem with those files, I think, is they're huge, and they're, they're not ordered, so processing them each time takes a, a bunch of work. Um, the Columbus County tax information was supposedly in an XLS file. It's named XLS, but it's not XLS. It's a Navy diff format, which I never heard of before, but it's apparently a very old spreadsheet interchange format, and it turned out I was able to find some code online that could process that. It had a little bug, it needed to be fixed, but um, probably the Navy diff was the hardest, although once you get it working, it, I mean, it's not that hard. It, um, it's just initial. But CSV would have been lovely. <laughs> <laughs> cool, thank you. Okay. Hi, great talk. Uh, I, as I understood, OpenBlock is a tool to give visibility to data that already exists, uh, provided for the gov by the government or something like this. Is there a channel so people can interact with the website to correct the data or add metadata? There are, correct data, or can you like flag stuff? I don't think so. I don't think no. we have that yet. So like if you were looking at a property <coughs> transaction, you say, hey, by the way, this isn't right, this isn't where I live, or. Uh, yeah, or, or for the user to add a layer about his, pers his, his perspective about the data or the county, the city. I think that's the kind of stuff that every block has added, more community interaction and commenting on things. Um, we don't have that yet in open block with what we're working on, but that may be something that we wind up adding. Great, thank you. I think that was all we had time for, so um, feel free to come up and talk to us. Program chair schedule. So <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>